to talk about mentalization, and I thought to get us started, um, we will um, just look at a little video. How do I move it forward? How do I move it forward? Green button. Oh. I don't see a green button. <laughs> Oh, that's the, that's the oh. pointer. Okay. Up, up on there. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so um, I thought to, to get us started to define oh. mentalization, to, to rather than, than, than talk about it too much, to, to show it to you. Sorry. You're going to have a tea party with Play-Doh. I'm going to serve myself. Here's Sarah. No! Well, you've probably discovered that however smart your three-year-old is, she doesn't seem able to put herself in someone else's mental shoes to imagine how they think and what they believe. Perhaps you thought your parenting skills were to blame, but scientists suggest that understanding other minds is a skill that may not be fully developed until a child is about four. To learn how children's social skills evolve between about three and four, researchers use something called a false belief test. What do you think's in this box? Looks fairly obvious, doesn't it? Crayons. But let me show you. I filled it full of candles. All right, now I close it up again. While you and I have been having this conversation, Snoopy has been down here asleep. Doesn't know what we've talked about. But let's bring him into the conversation. Now I have another question for you. What do you think Snoopy will say if I ask him what's in this box? Crayons, obviously. What else could anybody possibly say? Well, watch this three-year-old. What do you think is inside this box? Okay. Open it up and see. Candles. Now, you can ask the child what appears to be a very simple question about that. What did you think was inside the box when you first saw it? They say, oh, I always thought that there were candles in this box. Then you can ask them about someone else. So you can ask them about Snoopy. Snoopy's been sitting here. He hasn't seen this box. He's never seen us open it up. What does Snoopy think is inside this box? Uh, candles. Children say the same thing. Snoopy will think there are candles inside this box. And what that indicates is that the children's view of how minds work is very, very different from the view that you and I would have. Yes. Did you see it? In the mind of the three-year-old, Everyone sees the world much the same way. There's no difference between what I think and believe and what everyone else, including Snoopy, thinks and believes. It is, in a sense, a naive and innocent view of the world, a kind of mental Eden. And then, about four, comes the fall from grace. Now, if you take a four-year-old, quite typically, the four-year-old will tell you that, as a matter of fact, he thought there were crayons in the box, and then he found out that there were candles in the box. You can ask him about Snoopy, and he'll say, oh, no, Snoopy will think that there are crayons in this box. Great. Why will he think that? Because it's a crayon box. Mm-hmm. That's right. And that's going to make him think there are crayons. What's really in the box? Candles. Right. And then you get the five-year-olds who are just utterly blasé and think that this is such an obvious thing, it's silly even to ask the question. What that shows is that by the time children are four and five, they have a view of the mind that looks much more like our view of the mind. They understand that things can be tricky and deceptive, that you can change your mind, that things aren't always the way that they seem. And that gives them a very different vision of how the mind works and how people work. Remember, we're sharing this. Oh, I need that. And then it's my turn. Children who pass the false belief test now understand that other people can have different beliefs, even mistaken beliefs. Some scientists suggest that this test is further evidence of innate brain circuits specialized for reading other people's minds. They call it a theory of mind mechanism. All right, thanks so much. So, mentalizing, what do we mean with it? As you heard Alison Gopnik talk about it, the capacity to reflect on one's own thoughts and feelings and those of others to predict and understand behavior. People can change their minds. I can change my mind. Mentalizing implies that things are not always as they seem. Things are not always as I think they are. It promotes uh, uncertainty and curiosity, seeks clarification, and it embodies a non-knowing stance. Uh, it implies the ability to take the perspective of another while holding on to myself. 
It implies thoughts and feelings or knowing or understanding that thoughts, feelings and behaviours are connected and dynamic. Not only the thoughts, feelings and behaviours change themselves, but also the connections between them change. It also implies ref uh, reflecting while regulating affect and integrating while reflecting while regulating affect. All right, so what's the developmental model for, for mentalization? Um, some of you may have seen this. This is Peter Fonagy and his colleagues' work. Um, this was published in Development in Psychopathology, and like any good development, developmental psychopathology um, model, you have distal factors and proximal factors. On the distal side, you have constitutional um, factors that uh, on mother and or father's side um, that interact with early caregiving con context that may or may not lead to um, uh, attachment disruptions, in turn leads to poor self-other differentiation, so the individuation process from a more psychodynamic uh, perspective, if you will. That leads to problems in mentalizing, um, which leads to uh, vulnerability for attachment activation, um, and then emotion dysregulation. And this is then the kind of central engine that keeps the vulnerability going for these pre-mentalizing modes that are then associated with the symptoms of BPD. What are the pre-mentalizing modes? There are three that have been identified. Um, and um, remember, the pre-mentalizing modes are really the ones that we consider before the age of four um, in typically developing uh, children. And uh, the first one, psychic equivalence, uh, means because, because I think it, as you saw with a little boy, because I think it, it is true, what is in my mind is out there in nature. My perspective reflects reality. An example um, is Obama is not a citizen. Um, <laughs> pretend mode, um, really, uh, to, in, in order to identify pretend mode in a patient's mentalizing, the person must be using mental state language, but it lacks coherence and authenticity. So it doesn't hang together in terms of past and present and in terms of other information that you know. Um, keeping with the same theme, an example is I deeply respect and care about women's feelings. Um, the teleological mode is really absent, an absence of mind. So this is trying to solve problems in a very behavioral, a concrete, a goal-directed way without really referring to the mind. And an example is there, let's build a wall to solve our immigration problems. All right. So here's the mentalizing cube. How do we then address this in therapy? Um, uh, my post student, Kiana Wall, and I uh, tried to make, uh, uh, to kind of expand the, the, the mentalizing map in a three-dimensional space um, this way. Um, there are these four dimensions of mentalizing, so explicit, implicit, self, other, cognitive, affective, external, and internal. And so if we look at a person here, for instance, this is a person who's engaged in affective mentalizing, so a lot of emotion uh, about others, and it's explicit mentalizing, so the person's aware that they are busy mentalizing. It's not unconscious. And it is an X, so it's making use of the external features of the face, for instance, the eye region of the face versus the internal world. So what we do in therapy is we're trying to move people uh, to the middle of that cube, the, the, where that M is, if you kind of really try and think about it as a three-dimensional space, right in the middle, you'll have kind of optimal mentalizing that is considering both self and other, explicit, implicit, cognitive and affective, and ex uh, external and in, in, internal features. So uh, that's why mentalizing is quite hard, because you have to do all of these things at the same time in a dynamic situation while things keep, while, uh, at the same time things keep changing. So here's uh, how it plays out then in the therapeutic situation. If the patient's at the external um, focus, you move them to internal. If they're busy with self-reflection, you try and introduce other reflection. If they're engaging in emotional distance, you try to move them to emotional closeness. If they're over-cognitive and cold while talking about being raped, you move, try to move them to affect. If they're just using explicit um, uh, mentalizing, you try to um, uh, activate implicit mentalizing. Where there's certainty, you try to introduce that. Out. Um, how do we do this in the moment? Uh, this is actually five um, steps that we are using in a mentalization-based treatment in South Africa with orphans. Um, the first step is you, you focus with the patient um, in the here and, in, uh, and the now. So you, you bring the patient into the room. Both of you have to be present. Um, you use, make use of affect. Um, uh, you also name. Um, this is basic mentalizing. What are you thinking? What are you feeling right now? Then you expand. You use metacognitive capacities, elaboration, and challenge. So this is the cognitive part of mentalizing. 
You regulate, which in this context means to learn. So you generalize, you take what you're learning, um, what you, what's busy happening in the relationships uh, right now, and you generalize it outside the therapy room. And then you reward. You give the uh, patient feelings of competence about what they're learning in terms of mentalization. Um, here's it broken down in another way. We have a narrative of an event, an experience of the, uh, at the time, reflection on the event, the current feeling about the event, the experience, talking about it in therapy, and then the generation of alternative perspective. This is all we try to achieve is alternative perspective. And to summarize it for you, it's a collaborative process. Uh, we always have a, a mentization-based formulation. Um, so it's trying to formulate the, the individual's um, problems in mentalization-based terms. And we can expand that model and work with it as we progress through therapy. Identification of non-mentalizing process. So one, you, you want to be able to watch the video of you doing mentalization-based therapy and identify when the person was in pretend mode, when the person was in psychic equivalence, and so forth, and match the intervention to what's happening in a therapy session. The overall attitude is a not-knowing stance. The principles for the clinician is to, to restore or maintain mentalizing. The intervention consist, uh, is consistent with the patient's capacity. Um, uh, you're not going to do very, um, a, a lot of um, uh, mentalizing the relationship work with someone with very uh, basic mentalizing skills. Um, you identify the mentalizing poles, as I, con as I demonstrated to you, and try to move the person uh, to the middle. Um, you have to continuously monitor your own mentalizing. It's an authentic and open-minded clinician. Um, you, you're alerted to breaks in mentalizing, monitoring of the state of affective arousal. You cannot do um, some of the more cognitive pieces when a person is dysregulated. Focus on contingency and marking of the intervention. So we're not directly concerned with the content or the narrative, but with helping the patient to generate multiple perspectives, to free him or herself from being stuck in reality of one view, primary representation and psychic equivalence, to experience an array of mental states, secondary rep representations, and to recognize them as such meta-representation integration while remaining affectively regulated. And the trajectory of sessions, um, it starts with empathic validation to exploration, clarification, and challenge through affect identification and affect focus, but you constantly move through this depending on where the patient is uh, in the session. Explicit identification of clinician feelings related to the patient's mental processing. And this is just the evidence for MBT in general. This is, just came out in JAMA, um, which is a, a meta-analysis of the uh, borderline treatments right now. The ones in red is, is, is MBT. So from that standpoint, uh, we're doing okay, although it's not many, uh, if we compare it with anxiety and depression. Um, but um, here is where I think the biggest work still needs to happen. Alison Kalpacha and I adapted actually an incel model uh, that informed RDOC um, for borderline personality disorder really with our own work in mind, but this is what a real translational spectrum looks like. This is what, um, if you have really identified an end of phenotype that uh, functions across multiple levels of analysis right through to the intervention, then this is what you're able to complete. Um, we've just, for this paper in JPD, we just completed, or sorry, PDTRT, we just completed it on the basis of some of our work um, in, in mentalization. But if you really want to demonstrate mechanistic, um, you know, potential or validity of a mechanism, this is really where you want to end up with and being able to show that that mechanism does its work at all of these different levels of explanation um, linked to the target and exactly how you're targeting it in um, your therapy. Across development, it's just a normal, abnormal range. You have to be able to show how the environment influences and you have to have the measures that go with it. So this is like a, you know, a hundred people's careers, but, but there we go. Um, all right, and I'll end with please come to ISSPD. <laughs> Thank you.